that would be the biggest thrill for me in my fake sports life. So I think I look pretty damn good in that leotard, John. I'm so lost without you. It's like reverse anthropomorphization. If you could be one character in one movie. You kind of strike me as like an AMC pacer kind of guy. Yeah, so you really are exploiting the crap out of that time machine there, Kurt. Hello, world. Yep, this is Smart Dribble and your co-host, Kurt Schneider, along with... John Ellenthal. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kurt. Nice to see you tonight, John. Nice to see you. And now you've revealed what time of day it is. Yes. But for our listeners, it's any time, because what matters more is when they listen, not when we record. True. I have good news for you, Kurt. Which is what, John? We have an excellent episode set up for today. It is completely natural, normal human to wonder what it must be like to do a bunch of things that we don't do in our regular everyday lives. What would it feel like to be the president for a day? What would it feel like to walk on the moon? What would it feel like to be a character in a movie? So we're going to spend time today dreaming about if you could do blank, what would it be? So how's your imagination working these days, Kurt? Like it always has, John. It's better than my reality. Uh If you could do a podcast, what would it be about? Uh, Smart drivel, I think. There you go. Well, that's one of the rare instances where things you imagine yourself doing overlap with things you are doing. Or it could be, I could do a podcast weekly on the best ways to prepare mac and cheese. Yes, that no doubt would find an excellent audience and the sponsorship offers are pouring in. (laughs) <laughs> so you want to kick us off with our first, if you could blank? John, if you could be a professional athlete, be any position in any sport, what would it be? Well, I think this is something that I've thought about a great deal. I'm a big sports fan. And when you watch someone hit a game-winning home run or catch a game-winning touchdown or score a game-winning goal, you wonder what that must feel like. So I think it comes down for me to either hitting a game-winning home run in the World Series, or this is a tough one to beat, or scoring the Stanley Cup winning goal in overtime of Game 7. The sudden death aspect of it would add something to it that would be hard to replicate elsewhere. So I would like to win the Stanley Cup. With an overtime goal, Kurt, that would be the biggest thrill for me in my fake sports life. Not to get too picky here with my dream scenario, but it would need to be a nice goal too. Like a beautiful snapshot from the slot that's just, you know, beats the goaltender up high as opposed to there was just a scramble in front of the net and I was able to poke it in with my stick. So I'd like it to be a highly skilled play as well if I could. What's a snapshot? I can tell you're a big hockey fan. I know what a slap shot is. I don't know what a snap shot is. It's more of a wrist shot as opposed to a big wind up. You basically snap your wrist. Well, John, as our listeners know, I played football my whole life and I always wanted to be a quarterback in the NFL, but that isn't it. You know what I'd like to do? If I could, I would like to be Nadia Comaneci in 1976. (laughs) The perfect 10. To be perfect would be awesome for that one moment in time to get a perfect 10, knowing that you nailed every single component of this athletic endeavor would be really, really cool. On the world's biggest stage for your sport as well. Now, I did not anticipate you saying that, and I'm having a hard time getting the idea of you in a leotard out of my head. So how do you think you would look in a leotard being perfect in the Olympic gymnastics meet? Well, I think in order to be perfect, I'd have to be in pretty decent shape. And I'd have to be able to contort my body in ways. So I think I'd look pretty damn good in that leotard, John. Yeah, you might want to go out with one of those male gymnastics uniforms. Because oh. I don't know if you knew this or not, but Nadia Comaneci is a woman. So you yes. would have to dress in that garb to really experience that moment. So I'd be okay with that. You know what? If there's anybody I know that would be okay being seen by the entire world in a women's leotard, Kurt, it would be you. So that, if I could do one athletic event, I'd like to be Nadia Comaneci, 1976 Olympics, perfect 10. Well, look, you get bonus 
creative points on that one because everyone thinks about, you know, being Tom Brady or, or being the center fielder for whomever. And you came up with something that was definitely off the reservation. Suddenly, I want to change my answer to being secretariat, winning the Belmont Stakes by 31 lengths, because it's one thing to be the best and to be an all-time great. It's a different thing to be the best by so much that there really is no second place. And then there's people like Bobby Thompson who hit that home run off of Ralph Branca, and he said he was just fortunate to be the right guy in the right place. So. Well, there's a lot of controversy about that because a lot of the Dodgers felt that the Giants had stolen their signs, and Bobby Thompson knew what was coming. So what was that, 1951? Or two, yeah. So I think it was 51. I mean, that's obviously a quintessential, iconic moment in American and baseball history, which certainly has a big overlap. Let me ask you a trivia question about that moment. Who was on deck when Bobby Thompson hit that home run? Willie Mays. That's correct. It was his rookie season. And if you look at some of the old feeds of Bobby Thompson's home run, sometimes you can catch Willie in the on-deck circle. Pretty cool. Very cool. A great moment. All right. All right. So we're doing If You Could. So I asked you something. Give me a category here. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Oh, man. That's kind of a classic, if you would. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, there's so many out there, but I think it would be so damn cool to be invisible. Wow. Wow. How would you use your invisibility, do you think? And not at all times, just the ability, because you want to be able to come back and not be just, it's on and off. So tell me how you would exploit your power of invisibility. Would you put yourself in rooms that you wanted to hear the conversation? but you wouldn't otherwise be invited into? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there a particular room you'd like to be a part of? Yeah, I'd like to hear what Kim Jong-un is talking about in North Korea. I'd like to hear about what they're talking about in China. I'd like to go and hear what Queen Elizabeth really thinks about Brexit. I'd like to go. There's a lot of politics, I think, and government stuff. All right. Look, it would be incredible to be the proverbial fly, albeit an invisible one, and be able to overhear, learn about conversations that you'd otherwise never have the chance to. So that would be a cool superpower. And I ask of you then? Kurt Schneider, the invisible man. I think I would want to be able to fly. And Very I, cool. I, yeah, I haven't given this a lot of thought, but once in a while you look at a bird and the bird just takes off and flies and thinking, man, it would be cool to do that. And not only could you travel long distances in much shorter periods of time and take rather unusual routes. I just think it's got to be an unbelievable feeling to be able to soar up high in the sky and have a different perspective and move through the world that way. So I think it would be way cool to be able to fly. I like your invisible answer, though. I like your flying answer. What if you were flying invisible? Here's what I think we could do. Maybe I could fly and you could be invisible and sometimes we could swap. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gets to be if you could. So I would like to have a superpower that I can swap with your superpower from time to time. That's like those things like if you had three wishes, what would they be? The last one would be for a million more wishes. Right, exactly. So, all right. So let me ask you a question. You have the ability to, it's like reverse anthropomorphization. <laughs> You're going to become a car. What car would you become? So sticking with the, format. If I could be any car out there, what would it be? Well, there's a question I've legitimately never considered in my life. If I could morph into a car, I'm going to go with the first thing that came to mind. And I don't know why it came to mind. And I think a 64 Mustang convertible would be a classic, cool, quintessential to use that word again, iconic to use that word again. I need some new words, Kurt. But I think that's just captures a moment in time hmm. that it's not the fastest car. So it'd be cool to go really fast. I think you kind of strike me as like an AMC pacer kind of guy. Very nice. Well, you could be the AMC gremlin. We could be twin AMCs. Which was the car that back in the 70s, if you hit it from behind, it blew up? I think that was the pacer. It was a car. No, the like Pinto, that. the Pinto, Ford Pinto. The Ford Pinto. So there's something cool about the Mustang convertible. It's not modern, though, but it does sort of occupy a moment. And that moment just seems independent and 
uncomplicated in ways that are very attractive. That's, you know, because I would have thought you would have said the Tesla, because that's sort of you. You're like forward thinking. You're an early adopter. You want to get out there. You want to be sleek. You want to be good for the environment. You want to be a good person. You want to be, you know, forward thinking. I thought you would have been a Tesla, but I will take the 64. I'll tell you what, I did consider Tesla for a split second because... I think choosing an electric car is a good fit for what I would want to be. However, I think I met too many Tesla drivers early when Tesla first started being a thing. And they were, as a group, even though they're nice people, highly unlikable when it came to their cars because they talked about their cars like new parents talk about their kids nonstop. And they show you things about the car and things they can do with the car from their phone that is completely uninteresting to people who don't have one and may not want one. So. Look, I think what Tesla has done to advance the cause of electric cars, I'm all for. But there's something about Tesla and Elon Musk at this point in time that I don't quite want to identify with. We're going to stick with your 64 Mustang convertible. I love that. It's blue. I just realized it's blue. Nice. Is it a light blue or dark? Dark blue. Okay. Can you see the wind in my hair, Kurt? Yes, I can. You know what the funny thing is? I've, I had one convertible in my life. I know you have a convertible. I had one convertible once. And as it turns out, I'm not a convertible person. It's noisy. It's hard to talk on the phone, which of course wasn't a big deal back in 1964. But And it messes up your hair. Not that that's ever been terribly important to me. So maybe I've chosen the wrong car. But No, I think you know, I, I could see you in it like with air supply going on, like I'm all out of love. I'm, or out of love. I'm so lost without you. I need the Eagles on, Kurt, oh boy. just and to I would annoy you. <laughs> on 8-track. Uh, if I were a car, John, I think I would be Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kurt, tell us why. Well, first of all, I like the fact that Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was made with a lot of different parts from different type of cars. And then it's one of a kind and it's unique and it can fly and it can go in the water and it can do all these different things. And of course, it comes along with truly scrumptious in the co-pilot seat, which is a wonderful allegory. Okay, you go. I would be Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. So let me get this straight. You've got Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Nadia Comaneci. I need to raise my game Ah! a little bit. I need to come up with something that's truly out there. (laughs) Okay, you don't have to. All right, so how about this question for you, John? If you could time travel, where would you go? That's the first easy one we've had. Because the first decision you have to make is would you use the time machine or the time travel capability to travel backwards in time and experience some incredibly important historical moment? And, or do you want to time travel into the future? I would time travel into the future, Kurt. I think we have some sense of what's happened historically, although I'm sure you'd learn a lot from being there. But to see how things are going to unfold in the future, and see what life is like in the year 2100, that is where I would go. 2100. And what would you look for? I mean, would it be in a certain country? Would it be a certain planet? I mean, are you going to Mars? It's Earth, and it's not in a particular place. It's just on Earth to see what life is like, you know, 100 or so years from now, what's happened in science, what's happened in technology, what's happened in transportation, what the economy is made up of, what cool new foods there are how they look back on our particular time in history and how it's been packaged up for future generations to to make sense of. So I did think the chance to see what it's like and to look back on how history views now would be an absolute pisser. Wow. I would not like that for two reasons, John. The first is I saw Back to the Future 2, which was horrendous, and they go into the future. Secondly, and I hated that movie. Clearly that was traumatic for you. Secondly... I'm kind of of the opinion that I don't want to know what the future is because part of not knowing is what makes life so interesting to me. It's the anticipation. It's the thinking about what it could be, and it could be so many different things. So I don't want to know. I want to, I want to be able to imagine. So I'd like to go back. And there are a gazillion places in time, obviously, that we've talked about in the past, because you know I love history, that I'd like to go back to. I think I'd like to go back and live in ancient Rome, probably during the first real emperor, Augustus, who was Octavian and Julius Caesar's adopted son. But I think, I think during that time, because there was a lot of peace, 
and there was a lot of progress. If you had to go to some point, place in the future, when and where would it be? If this machine only worked forward, where are you going? I'm going to, I'm probably going to the Old King Coal Bar in the St. Regis Hotel in New York City and ordering a gin martini next week. Yeah, so you really are exploiting the crap out of that time machine there, Kurt. But wouldn't you like to see what your grandchildren and great grandchildren are like? That's something you're never going to be. Well, not never, but I meant your descendants are like, because you can only meet so many of your descendants before you're asked to leave. I think that would be cool. Okay, Kurt. So you would go forward one week. You have gone from the extremes of Nadia Komen HA to the other extremes of next week. I don't want it to be known. Hey, it's your fantasy. Okay. You and I both love movies. We did an entire episode on our favorite movies. If you could be one character in one movie, what would that movie role be? That's a tough one, isn't it? And we're not you would like to be Nadia Comaneci in the documentary of her perfect 10. No, but I wouldn't mind being Bugs Bunny in any of the old Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> but I think, because he always got the best of everything. But I think... I would be one of two characters, John, either Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark or James Bond in any of the Sean Connery, rest his soul, rest in peace, any of his, but probably Diamonds Are Forever uh, or From Russia With Love, I think, but maybe Diamonds Are Forever or even Dr. No, the very first one. I would be either James Bond or Indiana Jones. I would love, love, love to be those roles. You know, that fits the bill as well. So you want to be some sort of superhuman, heroic. Oh, no, no. They were very human, John. And they had both had very human flaws. They were not perfect people. Very human, very human. They basically, you know, went on all these incredible escapades and things. Adventures. Adventures. Yeah. And so you want to live your life in a tuxedo, drinking gin martinis, although, of course, shaken, not stirred. And that's how you identify. I was surprised by Nadia Comaneci. I'm not surprised by this one. All right. So what about you? I wouldn't want to be in a horror movie. I wouldn't want to be in a musical. I wouldn't want to be in a movie that was terribly violent, like The Godfather. You don't want to be in Beach Blanket Bingo with Annette Funicello? I don't think so. I don't think so. But I, I think I would like to play a prominent role in a comedy. Yeah. Because there's just something wall-to-wall fun. And there have been some movies, you know, whether it's Blazing Saddles or Young Frankenstein, where it just must have been an unbelievable hoot to be in those movies and make those movies. Yeah. I see you in the cockpit of Airplane, John. Yeah, Airplane would be fun. And, you know, even Willy Wonka would be great. So I'm having a Gene Wilder. Creepy. A little creepy. Well, the original is less creepy, but I agree with you. So I think I'm going to go with Gene Wilder in Young Frankenstein or Gene Wilder in Blaze. Blazing Saddles is my answer. Well, we're not talking about a movie. We're talking about a role. In- right. Gene Wilder's character oh, in oh. Blazing Saddles. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So moving on. This is the if you could. So if you all of a sudden had the ability to be an amazing painter, artist painter, not like house painter, but artist painter. (laughs) Would you like to paint like unbelievably skilled? You know, we're talking about Velazquez or or one of those beautiful painters, or would you like to be a Rothko, Jasper John, sort of postmodern Pollock type of guy? Vermeer is, you know, on one end, Pollock on the other. Uh, I think I will go with the first category because... I have no painting skill or artistic skill whatsoever. And the ability to represent something from real life and make it look lifelike with paint and all of the nuance, detail, I mean, that just boggles my mind. Amazing. And now the postmodern stuff is really cool in a different kind of way, but I can make cubes. Uh I cannot paint you know, the Mona Lisa or anything like that, that is just so, it's amazing how they can do that with the shades and all that kind of stuff. Phenomenal. And especially hundreds of years ago, right? They didn't have a photograph to be, or they didn't have like a 3D thing on their computer that they could figure out. They had to just 
put their thumb out and paint it. So I, I, look, I, I think there's something to that. And I am very envious of people who have that skill set. I would go the other route, however. I would go more like a Mark Rothko or Jasper Johns, as I said, or someone like that. Because, or you know what, actually, I would do more sort of the surrealists or the Dadaists, because what they decided to put down on paper was unbelievable. By the way, do you know that the Dadaists would do this thing? They'd sit up at night and they'd smoke cigarettes and drink coffee all night long. And they would do one of two things. One is... Were they waiting for election results? <laughs> they'd fold a piece of paper in like eighths. And then they would do two things. One time is they would start writing and they'd write like a story, but they'd fold it. So you just got the last line of their paragraph to start the next paragraph. And that would keep going. And they'd also do that with drawing. They would draw something, but you'd only see like an inch of what the drawing was in your section. And then you'd unfold it and it was amazing. It is pretty cool. Look, I admire art and artists, and I admire them even more since I'm so untalented in that regard. So I think we particularly admire things that we have no aptitude for ourselves. Okay. So when you were talking about movies, you were talking about heroic figures. Yes. And I think if I'm going to choose a character from a book, I would want it to be a heroic figure, but not necessarily in an adventurous kind of way, more in a intellectual and moral way, someone who stood up for something because it was right, even though it was amazingly unpopular at the time. So, so Atticus Finch is who you want to be. I'm going to go with Atticus <laughs> Finch. I just think you'd want to be a morally upstanding person who stood up for his beliefs and his values, despite it being unpopular. And in the end, you know, his way was more broadly knowledge as the way. So not like Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead. Not like Fountainhead. No. Or Ebenezer Scrooge. No, that doesn't feel right to me either. I, I think I would do something different because I've already been James Bond or Indiana Jones. So I would go a different route. I think I'd be the Velveteen Rabbit. <laughs> okay. Why would that be, Kurt? Well, because the Velveteen Rabbit comes alive, right? Even though the Velveteen Rabbit had one eye missing and the fur was it was all rubbed off in one area and it just sort of sat there. No one wanted to play with it anymore. It came alive because of love. And oh, I think goodness. if you could be the the perfect representation of love, that would be pretty cool. Well, that would be pretty cool. I thought you were going to say someone like Madeline or someone like that. Eloise would be kind of cool. Eloise or a book that I read a lot when I was a little kid. I don't know why, but Babar. Did you read Babar? Yes. I don't know why that was so popular. Babar and Curious George were very popular back at that time. Curious George, for sure. And Babar. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Babar. <laughs> All, right. All right. So, so this, this has been a fun conversation. It's been a lot of fun to talk about things we wish we could be and do because it's a fun place to spend time. And now that you've heard how Kurt and I would answer some of these questions, we would love to hear from you, our listeners. How would you answer the questions of if you could? Tell us on Twitter or Instagram at Smart Dribble. Or come check out our new website at smartdribble.com. Kurt and I would love to hear from you. Kurt and I will be back next week with a brand new episode of Smart Dribble, where we promise the dribble and hope for the smart. All right, Kurt, thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>